On this episode, we're going to talk about new real estate investing strategies for the COVID-19 era. Now, I've been getting a lot of questions on this topic, so I put this episode together for you based on a month of research into the data and the trends, interviewing property managers all over the U.S., real estate investors, real estate professionals to present to you what is going on in the housing market, in the rental market, so that you can make more informed real estate investing decisions during this era. Now, all the disclaimers out there, I'm not a economist, CPA, lawyer, guru, sorcerer, any of that kind of stuff, right? I do not have a crystal ball. But even if I did have a crystal ball, it wouldn't work any better than anybody else's crystal ball. So we're not going to steep this in predictions and speculation. Rather, we are going to talk about how to understand and think about what's going on so that you can make more informed real estate investing decisions. This is not specific investing advice. It's for general educational purposes. With that said, if you would like to go and have a deeper, more individualized conversation with my company, Maverick Investor Group, and get more of your personal questions answered, discuss your personal real estate investing goals and all of that, we are here for you and we support all of our clients in achieving their real estate investing goals, okay? So we would love to offer you a free consultation, get to know you and provide as much value to you as we can and get any additional questions answered that you may have if you're interested in buying rental properties in the U.S. So you can grab that free consult, schedule it at a date and time that's convenient for you. Just go to themaverickshow.com slash consult. And with that, let's get into the episode. This is The Maverick Show, where you'll meet today's most interesting real estate investors, entrepreneurs, and world travelers, and learn the strategies and tactics they use to succeed. And now, here's your host, Matt Bowles. Hey, everybody. It's Matt Bowles. Welcome to The Maverick Show. On this episode, I'm going to be talking about new real estate investing strategies for the COVID-19 era. We're going to go through how to make smart real real estate investing decisions based on the information that we currently have. I'm going to break this into two parts. The first is going to be how to optimize rent collection on properties you already own. So mitigating tenant default and navigating the eviction moratorium. And the second part is going to be how to strategically build your rental property portfolio during the pandemic positioning yourself to profit from the new COVID-19 era trends. All right, so let's jump into part one, how to optimize rent collection on properties you already own during the pandemic. Now, I have interviewed a number of the top property management companies in the U.S. just very recently, this past week, in fact, and remarkably, a number of them, including large companies that manage tens of thousands of properties, have been able to get most of the rent collected and are very close, as in within 3%, let's say, of their normal rent collection numbers from a year ago. Okay, So a year ago at this time, maybe they're 2%, 3% below what they would normally be in terms of total rent collections. So it is a lot closer than people think. And I talked to them about how are they doing that? Because obviously, tenants are struggling a lot more right now with the high unemployment and things of that nature. So a lot of people are surprised that those numbers are so high. And they talked to me about a number of the techniques that they're using to optimize that rent collection. And I wanted to go through some of them now with you so that you can use them on your rental properties, either if you manage them directly or if you have a professional property manager, you can talk to them about some of these techniques as well. So the first thing is to be kind and show real empathy towards your tenant and what they may be going through, okay? The second is to proactively communicate with your tenant and learn what they're going through. So don't wait until it's the first of the month and you don't receive a rent payment to then follow up and figure out why and what's going on. 
rather before the rent payment is due, reach out to your tenant, check in, see how are they doing, how's their health and safety, you know, all of that, and then see, you know, is everything okay with their job and all of that. So you're going to learn in advance what is going on in that person's life and be empathetic towards that situation, okay? Now, if they have had a financial setback, they've lost their job or they've been furloughed or something like that, and they are going through a difficult economic period, you're gonna be empathetic to that. And then you can talk to them and explain to them that you also have a mortgage to pay and expense obligations that come out of the rent that they pay. So you are both kind of in this situation together and you want to constructively work with them on a solution that can work for both of you. Okay. And then you can help your tenant apply for unemployment or stimulus benefits if they're self-employed, for example, or an independent contractor and they qualify for the Paycheck Protection Program or various different things like that, and you can help direct them to where they can get financial relief based on their situation, and then you can work something out with them. So maybe the unemployment payments are delayed, right? Because there's a backlog in a lot of the states, but when they come in, they are typically retroactive. So you get a lump sum going all the way back to the time that you got laid off or whatever it may be, okay? And there is a significant boost in the CARES Act, which gives people $600 a week on top of the regular state amount. So if the regular amount for the state is 400 bucks a week, they now get $1,000 a week, right? And so for a number of these tenants, if they're renting at like $1,000 a month or $1,200 a month, uh, you know, $1,000 a week in employment, that's $52,000 a year annual salary equivalent, okay? That might even be higher than what they were making before they lost their job. So if they're able to get that, they're certainly in a position to, you know, continue paying the rent. And you can just have a discussion with them about that and maybe offer to delay the payment, waive the late fees for them, let them know you understand. But then as soon as they get that, that they'll become current right away and continue paying on time every month. And you have that agreement that everybody feels good about that. Other things people are doing is accepting rent payments via credit card with no fees. In some cases, even just offering proactively to discount the rent and just say, listen, for the next two months, how about you just take a 10% discount off the rent? Just pay less rent, you know, because we're going through difficult times here. As long as you pay on time, I'll knock 10% off the rent. And a lot of people are incredibly grateful for that gesture. And then you can offer installment payments, right? If they're really going through something or they can't get the financial relief in time or things like that, you say, listen, can you pay half the rent now at least? And then the other half later on when you, you know, when you get the financial relief or, or whatever it may be and kind of create an installment payment plan because collecting some of the rent is a lot better than collecting none of the rent, but it all goes back to proactive communication and empathy and really working constructively with your tenant on a solution that works for everybody. And most tenants are really good, well-intentioned people that will appreciate your effort and will reciprocate in kind. So that's what the most effective property management companies are doing right now to collect a really high percentage of the rent that is, you know, within a few percentage points of what it would have been a year ago. Now, what we also have as part of the CARES Act that passed in the end of March is an eviction moratorium, which goes for four months. That's the federal eviction moratorium and applies to properties that have mortgages backed by the government. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac backed mortgages, for example. If you own the property free and clear, there's a different set of rules that apply. And then there's also some local eviction moratoriums that have varying different rules. So you need to check your local jurisdictions for those. But what the government did is they said, okay, you know, if there's a giant unemployment spike here, we don't want all these tenants to be evicted. And so they put the eviction moratorium in place in case the tenant couldn't pay the rent. But they also realized that if the tenant can't pay the rent, a whole bunch of property owners are therefore not going to be able to pay the mortgage. And there's that's going to result in a whole bunch of foreclosures, which is also going to be problematic for both the property owner and the tenant, right, if it goes into foreclosure. And so what they did as a backstop is they also put into place a mortgage forbearance program where they said that 
you do not need, if your tenant can't pay the rent, you do not need to pay the mortgage and you can get this mortgage forbearance. They're required to give it to you, right? Any Fannie and Freddie backed loans uh, are required to give it to you. And they cannot negatively ding your credit score. Okay, so that's what they said. And that was the concept to prevent foreclosures and all of that kind of stuff. So all of these things went into place. Now, a word of caution about the mortgage forbearance program, because I've also been talking with lenders around the country that specialize in the non-owner occupied investment property loans. That's their niche specialty. And this has been evolving regularly. So whenever you listen to this and before you take the mortgage forbearance, you're going to want to talk specifically to lenders and figure out what the latest is. But as of this podcast, the lenders are telling me that when you get into a mortgage forbearance program, it is going to be available for other lenders to see that your loan is in forbearance. Okay, so your credit score is not being dinged. Your, your point score is not going down, your FICO score, but other lenders can see that you're in a mortgage forbearance and they're not going to lend you another mortgage on another property if they see that you are in forbearance. Okay, so this is relevant for real estate investors who are trying to build a rental property portfolio because if you're in forbearance, you're not going to be able to continue to get more mortgages while you're in the forbearance program. So as of this recording, what the lenders want to see prior to giving you additional mortgages is the forbearance period completed. So let's say you go into 90 day forbearance, right? And it's possible to get this extended, but let's just say you need a 90 day forbearance and then your tenant is back paying rent and you're back paying your mortgage. Okay. So you're going to have the 90 day forbearance and then you will have worked out with the mortgage company what the repayment plan is going to be for that 90 days that you missed. And there's going to be a modification of the mortgage terms accordingly. And so after the mortgage forbearance period is over, then the next lender wants to see three on time monthly payments based on the modified mortgage that comes about after the mortgage forbearance period. So you finish the mortgage forbearance, you make your next three payments on time, and then a new lender will be willing to give you a loan. Now, obviously, some of this stuff is subject lender by lender and all that kind of stuff, and these terms are changing. So be sure to check on that before you make these types of decisions. I'm just giving you the latest and putting it on your radar that there are consequences for getting into the mortgage forbearance program, and you should just know about them and calculate them accordingly. All right, let's jump into part two, how to strategically build your rental property portfolio during the pandemic. And I think it makes sense to start off here with an extended discussion about the rent collection situation. If you're buying a new property, how to mitigate tenant default risk. Okay, during this period, which is an important topic to discuss. So let's begin with that and talk about strategies for stabilizing your cash flow when you're buying a new rental property or acquiring a new rental property during the pandemic period. Okay, so first of all, leapfrogging the eviction moratorium, right? It ends, the federal eviction moratorium ends in the end of July. Right now, that's what's scheduled to expire. And so if you have a tenant that's moving in, let's say July 1st, they are already going to pay the July rent up front, right? That's their move in. And they're going to pay last month in deposit too. So, you know, even if you you have a local moratorium that was extended a couple months beyond that, still first month, last month deposit, that's going to get you through, you know, whatever that would be, six months or so from the CARES Act if your tenant moves in on July 1st, right? And then as you move further and further down the line, obviously you're further into the clear, okay? So really new acquisitions for the most part with new tenants moving in and paying first last deposit is really gonna leapfrog over most of these eviction moratoriums. So they're gonna pretty much become a non-issue at this point, right? Assuming they expire when they are scheduled to. But what you're also gonna do, let's even say the eviction moratorium got extended, right? Who, who knows what's gonna happen in the future if it gets extended? Well, remember, you're gonna qualify your new tenant, before they move in, and you're going to re-verify their employment, okay? So at the time that they're going to move in, 
your property manager, who's ever qualifying the tenant, will call the employer, make sure that their job is stable and steady and all that kind of stuff, right? And you're moving in someone who is qualified with a stable job during this period, okay? And then remember the CARES Act unemployment boost that we talked about, okay? Worst case scenario, let's say they are qualified when they move in and then they lose their job. Well, remember that that unemployment boost, that extra 600 bucks a week, if you're renting to people at that $1,000 a month, $1,200 a month rent range, that $1,000 a week may very well be more than they were making prior to losing their job, okay? And that is available to them. So that's a really important stabilization factor for you, especially if you're deciding to rent properties in this particular rent range, okay? Another protection is you could consider using the Section 8 program, for government-backed rent. So a tenant that qualifies for the Section 8 program, that means that if they default on the rent for any reason, the government is going to pay the Section 8 portion of that rent, which in many cases can be pretty close to the entire rent. So you have a government-backed, government-guaranteed stream of rental income, even if the tenant defaults. And the final strategy I want to talk about for stabilizing your cash flow and protecting against tenant default is that you can actually buy tenant default insurance, okay? Backed by a Fortune 100 insurance provider, pays you up to four months of the gross scheduled rent in the event that your tenant defaults. New policies are still being issued now during the eviction moratorium. You can get this today. And the monthly premium amount is going to depend on the property details and the location, but you can check those for free, okay? You can just type in the address and the rental amount, and it will produce the estimate for you of what the premium would be to get that coverage. If you want to learn more about that, we have a resource page about it. You can go to maverickinvestorgroup.com slash rental insurance maverickinvestorgroup.com slash rental insurance and just click through there and it'll click you through to the page where you can just type in the property address and the rent amount and it'll show you the uh, how much that would cost to get the tenant default insurance for that property. All right, now let's jump in to understanding the real estate market dynamics in the COVID-19 era. Okay, first off, market segmentation is really important. We're not talking about real estate in general as a giant monolith, okay? The first piece of segmentation I want to do is between residential and commercial real estate. Now, commercial real estate is likely to get crushed by this situation, okay? Billionaire investor Carl Icahn told CNBC he expects the U.S. commercial real estate market to crumble. He said he is shorting the commercial real estate market, and it is his biggest position by far. Okay, now why is it likely that the commercial real estate market will crumble? First of all, you're talking about office buildings, and one of the mega trends coming out of COVID-19 is an advancement of the remote work movement, okay? A lot of employers are realizing, oh, actually, my staff can work from home without coming into the office. They've been forced now to set up a lot of that infrastructure during the shutdown. And they're also realizing that it saves them an enormous amount of overhead if they don't have to pay for all of this office space. So you've got on the one side, staff and workers that prefer the location independent freedom to work from home, or for that matter, to be a digital nomad and travel the world and work from wherever they want. And they realize that they can, in fact, do their job very effectively from wherever they want to work from. So they want those freedoms now because they've experienced it. And on the other hand, you have the employers who are realizing, yeah, actually, they can submit their deliverables and do their job and work effectively, perhaps even more productively because they don't have to commute and all those things. 
And it just saves an enormous amount of money for the company to get rid of that office overhead. So that remote work movement that was already trending in that direction has likely been catapulted forward many, 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 many years, okay? Also, retail buildings are in trouble for the same reason, right? Online shopping was already a trend moving in that direction. This has catapulted everything forward in terms of being able to shop online and not need to go into retail buildings. And finally, and this may be the most significant trend of the COVID-19 era, apartment buildings are in trouble. Tenants are fleeing dense communal living situations, and they are moving into single family rental homes. A number of the property management companies I've spoken to are already seeing this trend happening. Okay, now in contrast to commercial real estate, when we talk about residential real estate, the opposite is true. It's basically the reciprocal end of the spectrum because the home has become the center of the universe during the COVID-19 era. Not only does everyone still need a place to live, but during the pandemic, people have been sheltering in place in the home for safety. They've been working from home. The home has become their office. They've been shopping from home. They have been learning from home or teaching from home, depending if they're a student or they're a teacher. And so the actual utility value of the home has increased during the COVID-19 period, right? Now, there are three COVID-19 era trends that are increasing demand for affordable single family homes. So one is the de-densification trend where you have lateral transitions from people that are living in apartments and condos that do not want to live in those spaces with shared elevators and shared laundry rooms. And they are moving out into affordable single family homes. The second trend is downsizing. During the recession, it is forcing some people to move from more expensive properties into more affordable properties. So there's a downsizing trend, also increasing demand for single family homes. The third trend is an increasing total number of households post quarantine. Okay, so during the lockdown, Some people were making babies and other people were getting divorced and breaking up, right? Whether that's a relationship or that's roommates that were living together. In any case, post-quarantine, we are seeing an increasing total number of households and a higher demand for single family homes, So, for example, regarding some of these trends, on May 12th, the Wall Street Journal published an article entitled Coronavirus Escape to the Suburbs, Cooped Up and Concerned About the Post-COVID Future, Renters and Owners Are Making Moves to Leave the City Permanently. On May 21st, the chief U.S. economist at High Frequency Economics said home sales are expected to increase due to a combination of pent-up demand as well as a desire to move to less densely populated areas, okay? So these trends are underway and they're being reported all over the place. Now, I also want to talk about how COVID-19 is impacting home prices because a lot of people's association with a recession, which is what we're in now, They can't call it that until the quarter is over because the definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP, and they can't officially label it that until the quarter is over. But we are in a recession right now. And when a lot of people hear that, their reference point is the Great Recession of 2008-2009. And of course, in that recession, home prices crashed pretty dramatically. And 
that's people's association with a recession. So what I want to do is I want to clarify for you that in the last five recessions that have happened before this one, over the last 40 years, four out of the five of those recessions, meaning the ones before the Great Recession, the previous four recessions, in all of those, home prices increased. All right. And Core Logic says here that in every recession before the 2008 financial crisis, housing supported GDP as other industries faltered. All right. Now, I want to break this down a little bit further so that you can understand the fundamental differences between the Great Recession of 08 and today's Great Shutdown of 2020. All right. Now, in 2008, and, you know, Maverick Investor Group was founded in 2007. So we not only lived through this, but helped people make smart real estate investing decisions through this period of time. A lot of our clients got amazing deals and are doing incredibly well with the things that they bought through this era because they made smart decisions. But let me explain to you what happened in the lead up to the Great Recession and what caused all of that housing price collapse to happen, okay? So first of all, you had what were called ninja loans. No income, no job, no assets, <laughs> right? Basically, to get a mortgage on a property, you basically just had to breathe and fog up a mirror, right? If you had a pulse, you could get a loan, all right? And if you couldn't afford the down payment, well, you could get 100% financing. And if you couldn't afford the mortgage payment, well, that was okay. You could just pay the interest portion. You didn't have to pay any of the principal. And if you couldn't afford even the interest portion of the loan, <laughs> well, that was okay too, because you could get what was called a negative amortization loan, which means you could pay less than the interest that was due on the loan. And then they would just tack on the difference to the back end of the loan. All right. Now, what would eventually happen, of course, is that these were called adjustable rate mortgages, which means that after a certain period of time, like let's say three years, the entire mortgage would adjust and you would owe principal, interest, the negative amortization that got tacked on, you know, and all of that. And the whole thing would adjust and your mortgage payment required each month would double or triple, okay, in about three years. So those were basically, you know, an exploding mortgage is basically what that was, right? And the idea was that people would take them because they would say, well, that's okay because in less than three years, I'm either going to sell this property for more money and make my capital gain, or I am going to just refinance it under the same loan terms before the end of the three years and then just get another three years to have this negative amortization loan product and just kind of keep doing that forever. So these were the types of things that were going on. And as a result, as you can imagine, what that did, since pretty much anybody could get a loan, is it was skyrocketing the speculation and just driving home prices up at an insanely unsustainable rate. So in some markets like Las Vegas, you would see home prices increase at 50% a year, five zero. 50% a year, home prices would just skyrocket through the ceiling in one year, okay? So people were saying, wow, I can get in, I can buy a property, I'll get a loan, I don't have to qualify for it, I don't have to be able to make the payments, and I can just sell it in a year and it'll go up 50% in value. I mean, this was the mentality and this was what was going on. So you had incredibly unsustainable home price increases. Homeowners could not afford the mortgage, uh, and if they were in a primary residence, they couldn't afford the mortgage. If they were an investment property, it was definitely not producing a positive cash flow for them, right? So they didn't have a positive cash flow situation where they could just hold it regardless of the market. They needed to get the market appreciation or they would be in a really problematic position and be negatively cash flowing and not be able to sustain the property. And so the speculators drove up the home prices. And then what happened on the back end was that once the banks gave these loans, they would sell them on the secondary mortgage market. And there was a whole bunch of 
shady stuff that happened in terms of how these loans were packaged and sold as mortgage-backed securities and misrepresented in terms of the risk, okay? Because these buyers were not qualified and these loans were going to explode in a few years and they weren't going to be able to afford the payments, but they were mischaracterized in many cases in terms of the actual risk that went along with these loans. And so there were so many of them and they were selling them on the secondary mortgage-backed securities market and they got all through, this is basically what became known as toxic mortgage debt, right? And the toxic mortgage debt got all throughout the system, all throughout Wall Street, all throughout these institutional retirement funds and everything else got everywhere. And then all of a sudden it exploded, right? And people couldn't make their mortgage payments and they couldn't sustain their investment properties, right? So if you lived in the house, you couldn't make your mortgage payment. Foreclosure is where that's going. And if you had an investment property and your rent didn't cover your mortgage and your expenses, you weren't able to sustain a negative cash flow if when the home price crashed down and you couldn't sell the property. So that led to foreclosure. So therein is what happened and led to the mortgage meltdown and the foreclosure crisis and all that. Now, it's a really good book about all of this if you want to read about it by Michael Lewis called The Big Short. It was also made into a really good movie if you prefer to watch that and you can learn more about how the whole thing unfolded. But basically, The Great Recession was rooted in based upon the U.S. mortgage and real estate market. And that the entire global financial crisis was centered around the U.S. real estate and mortgage market. Okay. So that is why all of those home prices came crashing down and all of that in 2008. Now, what happened after that is they passed legislation, the Dodd-Frank Act, for example, in particular, which fundamentally changed mortgage guidelines and mortgage qualifications, for example. Okay. And so for the last decade, people have actually had to qualify for mortgages. So real estate investors have been putting 20% down. They're getting principal and interest loans. You know, they're actually qualifying with their debt to income ratios and their assets and their income and all of those things, right? And home prices have been appreciating, but they've been appreciating at sustainable rates year over year. They haven't been going up at 40% a year or 50% a year like they were in the lead up to the 08 crash, all right? So all of those things are fundamentally different, right? Now, the recession today was due to the sudden spike in unemployment and the business disruption, which was due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the corresponding shutdown that happened, okay? And the result, though, was that the government quickly stepped in to stabilize home prices, with mortgage forbearance and foreclosure moratoriums, thus far preventing a foreclosure crisis and preventing the widespread need to sell your property low or any of those things, right? Now, we've also seen, of course, a decline in the total real estate transactions during the shutdown. But the drop in home sales does not correlate to a drop in home prices, okay? And so I want to talk about the distinction between those two things, because to understand home prices, you need to understand supply and demand dynamics during the COVID-19 era and what is going on there. OK, so, for example, on April 18th, Fannie Mae put out a report that said they predict that home sales will drop 15 percent in 2020. OK, now, that doesn't have anything to do at all with what home prices will do in 2020. It just means that the total transaction volume will be down. You have to ask, why will it be down? Will it be down because of a drop in supply? Or will it be down because of a drop in demand? Or will it be down because of a drop in both? Okay, so on April 18th, Fannie Mae said issues with both supply and demand are expected to contribute to the decline in home buying activity. On the demand side, the rapid rise in unemployment will curtail many Americans' ability to afford a home. But on the supply side, the number of listings is falling. Now, Zillow on May 13th said new listings are down 39% year over year. And on May 21st, the lead economist at Redfin says 
Home buyers are getting back out there, searching for more space as they realize using their home as an office and school may become the norm, but sellers are still holding off on listing their homes, partially due to economic uncertainty and also concerns of health risks. Okay. Now, I want to also take you back before the pandemic in the U.S., before the great shutdown in the U.S. happened. And let's go back to February, all right, of 2020, where Freddie Mac put out a report that said the United States suffers from a severe housing shortage. 2.5 million additional housing units will be needed to make up this shortage. Okay, so that was the supply-demand imbalance leading in to the great shutdown, okay? Now, on April 13th, Freddie Mac issued a report saying the fiscal stimulus provided by the CARES Act will mute the impact that the economic shock has on house prices. Additionally, forbearance and foreclosure mitigation programs will limit the fire sale contagion effect on house prices. We forecast house prices will fall a half a percentage point over the next four quarters and that two forces will prevent a collapse in housing prices. First, as we indicated in our earlier research report, U.S. housing market faces a large supply deficit. And second, population growth and pent-up household formation provide a tailwind to housing demand, okay? So when they talk about population growth and pent-up household formations, that's pretty much the politically correct way of saying what I said earlier about people have been making babies in the quarantine or they're getting divorced and breaking up and there is increasing household formation, right? So there is more demand, there's an increase in demand, and there is a supply deficit going into COVID. And that supply deficit has been consistent throughout COVID because, of course, in the lockdown and everything else, that has further helped to constrain the supply Okay, so Freddie Mac is predicting that home prices will drop about a half of 1% over the next year. CoreLogic, their home price index forecast indicates that home prices will increase about a half a percentage point year over year basis from March 2020 to March 2021. So let's talk about if the real estate market is expected to be flat over the next year, right? Up or down a half a percentage point, pretty much flat. How do you profit from rental properties if national home prices are projected to be flat on average? Now, this is where rental properties as an asset class become fundamentally different from other assets that you can invest in. Because rental properties are a multi-dimensional asset class with five simultaneous profit centers. Now, the first profit center is market appreciation potential, okay, in the investor advantaged market segments. So if the national home price average is expected to be flat, that probably means that about half the home prices are going to go up and half the home prices are going to go down. So what we need to do is further segment the residential property market. And you want to position yourself in the high demand segments that have the most likelihood for appreciation. So first of all, you can do that by region and looking at the more recession resilient regions, which is where we help our clients buy their rental properties anyways, right? Pre-pandemic, we're going into investor advantaged areas of the country that have more advantageous price to rent ratios. They have lower than average unemployment. They have lower than average cost of living. People are moving into those markets. Jobs are being created, positive economic indicators, positive real estate fundamentals, But within those regions, you now want to look at the micro markets and the 
areas that are going to benefit from this growing demand from the de-densification trend as people are moving out of those apartment buildings, out of those densely populated areas into these detached suburban single-family homes. But then the third criteria is that you want to look at the specific niche within that asset class in terms of the price range, et cetera, because you want to go for the affordable single-family homes, right? Nice, desirable areas, but the affordable single-family homes so people can move out of apartments to rent them and they can move out of crowded areas to buy them if they're able to, okay? So that particular niche asset class is the one that is set to benefit from a lot of these trends. And so if you're positioning yourself there, you're positioning yourself to have the most likelihood of home price appreciation, right? So on CNBC, April 27th, they reported that home builders suddenly see sales jump as renters flee small urban apartments. The Wall Street Journal, May 5th, did an article called Why Home Prices Are Rising During the Pandemic. They said, while buyer demand has softened, and sales have fallen in March, the supply of homes on the market is contracting even faster. The economy is shrinking, businesses are closing, and jobs are disappearing due to the coronavirus pandemic. But in the housing market, prices keep chugging higher. So you want to get on the supply side of the growing demand trend for affordable single-family homes. Okay, but remember... You don't want to put all of your eggs in any type of speculative basket. So it makes sense to position yourself there for appreciation potential. But if the appreciation doesn't occur or it doesn't occur soon, that's okay because you have four other profit centers that are simultaneously working in your favor. Okay, so profit center number two is the cash flow from your properties. Okay, now in order to optimize this one, you want to buy properties where there is increasing rental demand. And the really cool thing about the situation we're in right now is that the same affordable single family homes that buyers are demanding are also in demand by renters. Okay, so those lateral transitions by renters who are renting apartments that want to rent single family homes. I'm talking to property managers that are already seeing this happen. So that shift, that migratory trend is happening. And then when you have tightening mortgage restrictions or you have, you know, unemployment spikes or business disruptions where people that would have maybe normally bought these homes now can't qualify for mortgages for any number of reasons, that puts them into the rental pool and it increases rental demand for that same property because they still want to live in the property. If they can't buy it, they'll rent it, right? So by owning those affordable single family homes in those desirable areas, you're positioning yourself to benefit from both buyer trends and renter trends and however it ends up playing out in the future, right? If less people can buy and more people can rent, fine, that drives rents up. If more people end up buying, great, that drives home prices up. Either way, you want to position yourself so that you win regardless of what happens. Now, the third profit center is the tax benefits. Now, the tax benefits of owning rental property is not impacted by COVID-19. It's not impacted by what home prices do. It's not impacted by what the rental market does, right? This is an independent profit center for you. Residential investment property is the most tax-advantaged asset class in the United States. The government allows you to depreciate the structure of your property, even if it is going up in value, and to take that as a phantom loss against your real estate income that would otherwise be taxable. And in some cases, you can take it against additional forms of income as well, including your earned income, but you need to consult your CPA about how to do that in your individual situation. And then, of course, there is the 1031 tax-deferred exchange, 
whereby when you go to sell your property, if you follow these compliance requirements, you can use the 1031 section of the tax code to do what's called a like-kind exchange, which means you're selling your property, you're using the formalities, and you're reinvesting the proceeds into another rental property or properties. And if you do that, you can indefinitely defer all of your capital gains and all of your depreciation recapture. And you can continue to do this all the way until death, at which point when your heirs inherit the property, everything resets and it's gone and nobody has to pay the capital gains or the depreciation recapture. Okay. Now, let me break this down just so that you can have an example of how the depreciation works on a rental property. Okay. Let's say you come into my company, Maverick Investor Group, and we help you purchase a performing cash flowing rental property in one of these high demand areas for $170,000 US dollars, fully renovated, tenants in place paying rent when you close. Okay. Now, let's say you determine that for that property, the land value ends up being $32,500. And therefore, the structure of the property that remains is $137,500. The IRS allows you to depreciate the structure of your property, not the land. And they allow you to do that over 27 and a half years. That's called your depreciation schedule. So on this property, in this example, that gives you a $5,000 annual depreciation amount. Now, let's say that your net cash flow from this property after all of your expenses is $400, okay? And that means that times 12 months, you'd have $4,800 a year taxable income. But you had the $5,000 depreciation loss that you're able to take against the $4,800 taxable income and pay zero taxes, okay? Now, If you're in, let's say, the 33% tax bracket, that is a tax savings on the 4,800 bucks of $1,584 that you would have otherwise had to pay, okay? So if your purchase price was 170 grand and you put 20% down on this property plus closing costs, let's say, so out of pocket, let's just say you were $40,000 all in out of pocket when you bought this property, a $1,584 tax savings is about a 4% annual return on your $40,000 that you invested. And you get that every single year for 27 and a half years, right? As you hold this property. So that profit center is there for you. That's chugging along. That's happening every year, no matter what happens with the housing market, the rental market, or any of that. Now, profit center number four is that your tenants pay down your mortgage principal and build you equity in your property, regardless of what the market is doing. So even if you don't get that home price appreciation and the market just stays flat for a really long time, your tenant is paying down your mortgage principal every single month. So you are building equity in your property, okay? And Realtor.com just published an article April 30th declaring mortgage interest rates have fallen to a new record low, the lowest it's been since Freddie Mac began tracking rates in 1971. So let's just talk a little bit about the basic benefits of financial leverage, okay? First of all, Real estate is the most debt favorite asset class. You can now lock in the lowest mortgage rates in history. You can get a 30-year fixed principal and interest mortgage if you qualify for conventional financing in the U.S. And the lower the mortgage rate, the lower the monthly payment, which means you're increasing your net positive cash flow. And because you've only put 20% down, you're increasing your cash on cash return by using that financial leverage. And as I mentioned, the tenant pays down your mortgage principal every month. Their rent covers your mortgage. So you're building equity regardless of what the real estate market does. So on this property that we're 
talking about here in this example, let's just say the real estate market stayed completely flat for 30 years. It's never happened in the history of real estate, of course, but let's just say for the sake of this example that you get no home price appreciation in 30 years. Well, guess what? You're going to own a $170,000 property free and clear with all of that equity at the end of the 30-year period because your tenant will have paid off your entire mortgage and you built all of that equity even if you got zero market appreciation. So by having all of these different profit centers functioning at the same time, you are positioning yourself to win and to be profitable regardless of what the different market fluctuations are in the short term. Now, the fifth and final profit center I want to talk about because I think it's the least understood profit center in this asset class is how you can profit from inflation by buying and holding residential investment property. And let's talk about how that works, okay? So first of all, just as a super basic primer on how inflation works, it basically devalues the dollar, okay? So it decreases your purchasing power. And you might notice this in a variety of forms. So you might look back 20 years ago and think about how much movie tickets cost 20 years ago versus how much they cost today. The price of movie tickets has increased, you don't get anything more. You just go in and you sit in the same seat and you watch the same movie, but all of a sudden it costs more, okay? That is inflation. Or you might notice it and you might say, hey, you know, my favorite cereal that I buy at the grocery store has been the same price for the last 10 years, but they put less cereal in the box. So now I'm paying the same price, but I'm getting less cereal in my box, right? So that's another way that you might see inflation manifest. But basically, the money that you're spending is buying you less. You're either paying more for the same thing or you're getting less for what you pay for. And the financial significance of this is that it silently destroys your savings, okay? So let's take a look at the inflation rate, the official inflation rate for the last 10 years. And we see that the inflation rate has gone up around 2% per year, okay? So it's about 19% and change, a little bit under 20% for the last 10 years. Let's just be conservative and call it 19%. Now, this is the official rate. A lot of people think it's much higher than this, but let's just use the official rate and say that in the last 10 years, inflation in the United States has increased by 19%. So let's talk about what this actually means for your investment situation. If you had $100,000 in 2010 and you put it under your mattress, and then in 2020, you went under your mattress and you pulled it out and you made sure it was all there, nobody stole any of it, you counted the bills and it was the same number of bills, the same $100,000 that you had put under your mattress, okay? That means it's the same number of nominal dollars. But what's happened over the last 10 years since you stuck the money under your mattress is that inflation has increased 19%. So that means that the same $100,000 today is only worth $81,000 in real dollars, inflation-adjusted dollars. That $100,000 in 2020 is only going to buy you 81% of what it would have bought you back in 2010, okay? Now, let's say that instead of putting it under the mattress, you put it in a savings account, right? And the savings account gave you 1% annual compounded return, okay? So you put it in the savings account in 2010, you got 1% interest compounded annually for 10 years. So when you look at your bank account in 2020, it says $110,462, right? You didn't do anything but allow that interest to accrue. You put 100,000 in and now you have $110,462. Those are nominal dollars, okay? That's what's in your bank account. But the reality is that when you adjust that for inflation, those 110,000 2020 nominal dollars are only worth 
less than 90,000 in real dollars. Okay, so the 1% interest that you were getting in your savings account did not keep pace with inflation. Inflation was higher than your interest rate. So you actually lost money in real dollars and that 110,000 balance in your savings account is only worth uh, less than 90% of the money that you put in to begin with, okay? Now let's say that instead you bought a rental property with that money. Rental properties have a built-in hedge against inflation. Home prices rise with inflation, okay? It is a hard asset, and as the price of lumber and brick and all of that goes up, so then does the cost to build a home. That's then passed on to the homeowner, and home prices rise at the rate of inflation. And rents also rise with inflation, Every year, you're able to renew your lease and you're able to increase your rent a little bit, usually. So in this case, if we're saying 19% over the last 10 years, about a 1.9% increase every year in your lease, which is a very reasonable amount to raise your rent and keep pace with inflation. Okay, So on the both the rental side and the home price side, they both rise with inflation. Okay. But what I want to talk to you now is not just how to hedge against inflation or make sure that you don't lose money to inflation. I don't just want to talk about keeping pace with inflation. I want to talk about how you can actually profit from inflation, how you can actually profit from it. So the way that you do that is you take out a 30-year fixed rate mortgage against your rental property. And when you do that, there's three different ways that you can simultaneously profit when inflation occurs, okay? So let's break this down. Okay, let's assume that you took that same $100,000 and instead of putting it on your mattress, instead of putting it in a savings account, you bought a turnkey rental property in 2010 and you bought a fully performing, renovated, tenanted, cash flowing property for $100,000, all right? If you bought that property in 2010, and let's just say the value only went up with inflation. Let's say there was no additional market appreciation. It just rose with inflation. So it rose that 19%. So $100,000 purchase of a rental property in 2010 is now worth in nominal dollars, 119,000 in 2020. Okay. So there was a 19% increase in the home price due to inflation, a $19,000 nominal gain. But since it only kept pace with inflation, there was a 0% gain or loss in real dollars. Okay. Now, if instead you bought that property with a conventional mortgage, a $100,000 property, you put only 20% down on it and you got an 80% mortgage, okay? So if you did that back in 2010, your equity in that property at the time of your purchase would be the amount of your down payment, which would be $20,000, okay? So back in 2010, you had $20,000 of equity in your property. Now, the thing with a mortgage is that even though you only put 20% down, you get 100% of the home price appreciation or the home price value increase. So the $19,000 that your home went up, even though you only put 20% of the purchase price down, you get 100% of that increase, okay? So in 2010, you had $20,000 of equity. In 2020, your property is worth $19,000 more in nominal dollars. So now you have $39,000 thousand dollars of equity, a 95% increase, nominal increase in your equity. And when you adjust for inflation and you take out the 19% inflation adjustment, you still have a 58% real increase in your equity that's in that property. Okay. 
a leveraged equity increase that you got just from inflation. That's assuming there was no market appreciation. The home price just went up 1.9% every year, which was the rate of inflation. Okay. Now, if it went up more than that, if it went up like 4% a year, then you'd be getting market appreciation on top of the inflation adjustment. But in this example, we're just talking about home prices going up with the rate of inflation and what happens with that. Now, the second way to profit from inflation is the leveraged net cash flow increase from inflation. So same principle here. Let's say that $100,000 property rented for $1,000 back in 2010. It increases in rent 19%. So you're renting it for $1,190 in 2020. Again, that's a nominal increase. There's no gain or loss in terms of real dollars. That's just the inflation adjustment. But if you use leverage, remember your net monthly cash flow that's actually coming into your pocket, let's say back in 2010, after you know you pay all your expenses and your mortgage and everything, the leftover net cash flow from the rent that comes into your pocket, let's say that was $200 back in 2010. This 190 additional dollars in rent just gets added to your net cash flow. Now, your property management fee will increase a little bit if it's a percentage based fee. So take 10% of the 190 out of there. So you have 171 increase to your net cash flow in nominal dollars. Now, when you adjust that for inflation, you take out the 19%, that is a 50%. Percent five zero fifty percent increase in your net cash flow in real dollars. And the third way that you can profit from inflation is through inflation induced debt debasement. So, the same way that inflation eats away at your savings in your savings account. It also works in your favor when you take out a mortgage by eating away at the principal balance of the debt that you owe to the bank. So in 2010, when you bought that $100,000 property and you took out that 80% mortgage, you borrowed $80,000 in real dollars in 2010. Now, in 2020, the 19% inflation ate away at the real principal balance that you owe, okay? So even if you paid down none of that principal balance in 10 years, the real principal balance in real dollars that you owe would be 19% less. It would be $64,800. That's what it would be worth, Okay, so it's still going to say the nominal number that you borrowed is the nominal number that you have to pay back, but you pay it back in future diminished nominal dollars. You don't pay it back in the inflation adjusted real dollars, right? So when you borrowed the $80,000 in 2010, those $80,000 were worth $1 each. When you're paying them back in 2020, those $80,000 are only worth 81 cents each. So those are the ways in which you can actually profit from inflation by locking in a 30-year principal and interest fixed rate mortgage. And the higher the inflation goes, the more that profit margin is for you. Now, we are currently in a situation where the government is printing money at a rate that will literally double the U.S. money supply, right? And when you have more money chasing fewer goods, that creates major inflationary pressure. And if inflation were to rise as a result of that, the impact of all these things we're talking about would simply get magnified, right? So by getting into rental properties now, preparing to buy and hold them for the long term, getting 30-year principal and interest fixed rate mortgages, you are positioning yourself to profit from 
inflation and potentially an increase in inflation based on all of the money printing that is currently going on now that will eventually work its way into the economy. So most people are concerned, as they should be, that in periods of heightened inflation, they're going to lose more money in real dollars, which they are if they're keeping that money in a savings account. But you have the ability to put your money into rental properties, take out a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, and position yourself to profit as inflation increases. So, Again, we don't know exactly what is going to happen in the future. There's a lot of people speculating about a lot of different things, about what's going to go on in the housing market, what's going to go on with inflation, what's going to go on with all these different things. And nobody knows exactly what's going to happen and exactly what time period it's going to happen in. And so that's why you can position yourself to win regardless of what happens by purchasing a multi-dimensional asset that has all of these different profit centers. So if one of them or two of them doesn't pan out or doesn't come through, at least in the short term, you have all of these other ones working in your favor. So you're hedging against your downside risk and simultaneously positioning yourself to profit in the event of increased inflation in the event of the increased demand and the migratory trends for these specific types of housing assets, et cetera, et cetera. You're making a smart, informed decision to mitigate your downside and increase your upside potential on multiple levels at the exact same time. Now, if you would like to have a one-on-one conversation about these concepts and get more follow-up questions answered, discuss how they can apply to your personal situation and how you can buy rental properties in these advantageous real estate markets, in these high demand investor advantage micro markets. We would love to chat with you and connect with you and do a one-on-one personalized consultation with you. We can do it over a Zoom video call, get to know you and see if it's a good fit to for you to work with Maverick Investor Group. If you would like to have that conversation totally for free, feel free to grab a consult registration spot at themaverickshow.com slash consult. Okay, so you just go to the website, www.themaverickshow.com slash consult. And there you'll be able to select your preferred time and date. And we can have a discussion about all these issues and support you as best as we can in your real estate investing journey. And I'll leave it there. Don't forget to subscribe to the show so you don't miss any episodes and feel free to share this episode. We'd really appreciate that with anybody that you think might be interested in learning more about what's going on in the real estate market today. All right, good night, everybody. Be sure to visit the show notes page at themaverickshow.com for direct links to all the books, people, and resources mentioned in this episode. You'll find all that and much more at themaverickshow.com. Learn how Maverick Investor Group can help you buy cash flowing rental properties in the best U.S. real estate markets, regardless of where you live. Schedule a free phone consult today at themaverickshow.com slash consult. Now you can buy rental properties with tenants and local property management in place so you don't have to be a landlord or a rehabber to get your questions answered and discuss how Maverick Investor Group can help you meet your real estate investing goals. Schedule your free phone consult today at themaverickshow.com forward slash consult. If you like podcasts, you will love audiobooks, and you can get your first one for free at themaverickshow.com slash audiobook. Whether you want the latest best-selling novels or books on investing, business, or travel, try your first audiobook for free at themaverickshow.com forward slash audiobook. Hey, okay, I got two numbers incorrect in the original podcast interview, so I'm going to swap them in here. The first one is that I said 76% on around 59 minutes and 10 seconds, and it should be 58%. So I'm just going to re-record myself saying, I I just listened to it, so I'm going to try to do it in the same tonation. I'm going to re-record myself saying, 
a 58% and then uh, have you just swap that in. So here we go. Okay, now when we get up to uh, 101 and nine seconds, <clears throat> there's a place where I say, now when you adjust for inflation, take out the 19%, we wanna cut right after that and insert the following. And now we want to just re 